Hello, everyone. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. I am Eliza Gonzalez, Manglik Mott. In today's special episode, we will bring you stories from across the nation on issues surrounding newly sworn in U.S. President Donald J. Trump. For the headlines. President Obama delivers a series of messages to the American people as his presidency concludes. Educators in New York take action against hate-based incidents in communities. Filipinos in America share thoughts on U.S. President Donald J. Trump. Nevadans take on Obamacare. Should it be replaced, repealed, or retained? Plus, a feature on the First Lady of the United States through the years. And stars who are holding back on U.S. President Donald Trump. Now for the details. U.S. President Barack Obama's term in office ended Thursday, days leading to his successor, President Donald J. Trump's inauguration. The outgoing commander-in-chief delivered a series of messages to the American people. His message, this is not a period, but a comma. Take a look. At a time when we turn the page on one year and look ahead to the future, just eight years ago, as I prepared to take office, our economy teetered on the brink of depression. Nearly 800,000 Americans were losing their jobs each month. And on challenges from health care to climate change, we'd been kicking the can down the road for way too long. Eight years later, you've told a different story. We turned recession into recovery. Poverty is falling. Incomes are rising. Almost every country on Earth sees America as stronger and more respected today than they did eight years ago. We have made extraordinary progress as a country these past eight years. It was the result of tough choices we made and the result of your hard work and resilience. And to keep America moving forward is a task that falls to all of us. Sustaining and building on all we've achieved, that's gonna take all of us working together because that's always been our story. The story of ordinary people coming together in the hard, slow, sometimes frustrating, but always vital work of self-government. It has been the privilege of my life to serve as your president. Know that I will be there with you every step of the way to ensure that this country forever strives to live up to the incredible promise of our founding. That all of us are created equal and all of us deserve every chance to live out our dreams. It was only in recent years that teachers, parents, and students have finally made a collective effort to stand up against the pressing problem of bullying. Although the problem of bullying has been exposed and publicly addressed in recent years, many wonder if there has been a big drop in bullying incidents or a change of attitude of students when it comes to this problem. In the recent months following the presidential election season, Reports of hate-based incidents have escalated across the nation, in communities, at the workplace, on the streets, even in schools, where children are supposed to feel safest next to their home. What have our schools done in order to address this? Have these recent hate-based incidents created an atmosphere that has empowered bullies again and set back what the anti-bullying campaigns have accomplished? What role do our educators play in making the students feel safe in the schools, especially those who might be prone to bullying because of the color of their skin, their gender, physical appearance, and or socioeconomic backgrounds? EBC New York Bureau has the answers. Take a look. was very complicated obviously for a lot of reasons and at least at this school I feel like there was a very strong uh, vibe that Hillary Clinton was going to be our next president and that would have meant a lot for a lot of people especially the girls who I thought were very much looking forward to that. A lot of it was like Trump stinks we wanted Hillary and I'm like they're seven they don't know anything about these guys the stances they you know held etc etc. So a lot of it, I just thought, was just, you know, propaganda. 
going with the flow. <laughs> To just look at things with an open mind, understand the government, we have three branches, and everything will be okay. Uh, bullying is difficult, and I believe it's absolutely unavoidable as much as, you know, people try to prevent bullying, bullying will still occur. I think it. Part of it is just being, you know, human, human nature. And I think it's just uh, an insecurity that a lot of people have that they decide to take out their frustrations on others. Bullying has been an ongoing problem in recent years, you know, because of what goes on in politics. To teach the kids to just have those core values to help prevent bullying. There was an incident where a child drew a swastika on, a, on the girl's bathroom wall. And it was terrifying. It was scary. The kids were scared. You know, they didn't know what to do. So in instances like that, what we try to do is talk to the kids and have them share their feelings. All I can do and I think all we can do is really teach them how to understand what a reliable source is, what empathy is. We can't process everything. We need to know who owns what, whose motive is what, and as long as they have these abilities to sort of research things themselves, that's all we can really do, and that's what my job is. But empathy is huge, just so they can at least think about what it feels like to be on the other side. I'm gonna go over the types of news that exist, so we're gonna go over what sponsored content is, what complete fake news, yellow journalism, satires. It's really looking at all the different types, and then at least arming them with the information that hopefully they can understand the subtle differences between all of them. We're all processing this. We don't necessarily know the answers and we have to figure it out together. So it's important that we can hear each other and respect each other so that we have a chance to sort of get to the future. And then, you know, if we don't like what we see, that they're the ones that are gonna change it. Coming up, Filipinos in America share thoughts on U.S. President Donald J. Trump. Nevada's take on Obamacare. Should it be repealed, replaced, or retained? Plus, a feature on the First Ladies of the United States through the years. And stars who are holding back on U.S. President Donald Trump. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will be back shortly. Welcome back. You are still watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. EBC Florida Bureau spoke to members of the Filipino community in Florida to ask them on their take on the newly sworn-in U.S. President Donald J. Trump. B.J. Escoto with the story. Take a look. One of the issues that the coming Trump administration will face is the growing uncertainty of minority, ethnic, racial, and gender groups. Over two dozen Filipino-American professionals gathered together to discuss important matters from their respective fields, as well as several upcoming cultural projects centering around the Filipino-American community. Some of the prominent figures in attendance for the council meeting today included lawyers, doctors, nurses, and a handful of veteran council leaders. Starting with me, I really did not like Trump at all. Even even just the primary, you know, I said I don't like that man because he filed for bankruptcy six times. And for me, I've worked all my life. I came from a very, very poor family in the Philippines and I struggled all my life. For me to file for bankruptcy is just protecting your own asset. You protect yourself and you forget other people. I voted for uh, Hillary Clinton but the people have spoken, so 
we should uh, wait and see what uh, President-elect Trump will do for the next uh, four years. Well, I don't agree with Mr. Trump. I don't think that he is um, competent to lead this nation. Um, I'm very fearful of him. I think he's going to be a detriment to the United States because he doesn't know what he's doing. I'm kind of scared with international relations because from what I've heard is he's not going to get too caught up in the politics of international you know, relations. He's going to let his vice or some type of secretary, I forget which one it is, but at least that's just what, what I've heard, you know, he's going to let that guy do it. I don't think he's going to follow through because he's already gone back on policies that he's uh, campaigned for, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did it. For the economy, I just hope that tax will go low. That's it. The thing that I like about Trump's policies is basically, uh, what, from what I've heard, uh, the health benefits that I'm, a, I'm for. But immigration-wise, I think it's too steep for me. So I think the U.S. should be more open. With some of the election dynamics that were going on where there might have been some things related to the Philippines and, and what have you, I think that overall Donald Trump is a friend to the Philippines. I know he had a, a Trump project in Manila. So, you know, if he's had issues with the Philippines and Manila, then uh, he's setting up shop in the wrong place. Now, granted, he's supposed to divest from all of his business practices and you know, run the nation. But, but the thing is, is I think we're going to be fine. Um, every four years, you're always going to have a, a nominee, somebody that gets elected, and there's always going to be somebody ticked off at the other side of the aisle. The Inauguration Day ceremony is expected to draw a great number of supporters and protesters. The Inauguration Ball itself has already experienced controversy due to performers pulling out or refusing to perform. Among those who are confirmed to perform are the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and Jackie Evancho, a young opera singer. One of the issues that the coming Trump administration will face is the growing uncertainty of minority, ethnic, racial, and gender groups. With only days away for President-elect Donald Trump's inauguration, many members of the Filipino community in the United States still question his leadership capabilities and political stance. Regardless of their varying opinions, many if not all of the Filipino community agree on one thing, that they will support Trump and wish for his success during his presidency. Reporting for Eagle News, I am BJ Escoto and I am one with 25. Thank you, BJ Escoto of EBC Florida. One of the things that have been in the forefront of President Trump's campaign rhetoric is to repeal and replace Obamacare. But what would be in store for the millions of Americans benefiting from this health care program? Is there a suitable and viable health care program that would be able to replace Obamacare in a timely manner? Julianne Docena of our Las Vegas Bureau with a story. History was made when President Barack Obama signed into law the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. But the road to passing the law was not an easy one to take. And when it was passed, there were still twists and turns on its path to success. So was it actually successful? We can't help but hear these days the plans of President-elect Donald Trump to repeal and replace it as soon as possible. Some Americans couldn't be more excited, while others are feeling more anxious wondering what's going to happen next. Let's hear what some of them have to say. I feel bad that he's, that's the first uh, you know, executive order that he's going to try to do because uh, Obamacare, or otherwise known or officially known as Affordable Care Act, has brought a lot of benefits to Americans. I feel like it's just great the way it is. It works the way it is, and I think it shouldn't change. And if there are changes made to it, I would like to know about it. There's not really too much better that he could do to improve it, you know, at this point. I think they just want to label it, you know, something that Republicans did and get rid of what the Democrats did. And I'm not even a Democrat, I'm pretty uh, neutral in the mix, and that's me saying that. So, yeah, I definitely believe that. I don't have any good thoughts about it. I think it all went wrong 
As we can see, there are people who feel troubled about the next steps if President-elect Donald Trump is successful in repealing what we more commonly know as Obamacare. And if you're not yet too familiar with what Obamacare is, Dr. Ferdinand Tan told us all about it. More Americans now are insured compared to before Obamacare was implemented. The rates of the healthcare rising costs have been slowed down since Obamacare was implemented. The other benefits of the Obamacare is that there is no more pre-existing conditions. Before, you're going to be excluded by the insurance company if you have a medical conditions that they would seem like very costly for them. And then it also extended coverage for those dependents, like if you're 26 years old, you're already in the college, you're still included on the uh, dependence of your parents. And then there's also removal of the annual or lifetime uh, maximum benefits before the insurance company will not be spending more than one million for your lifetime. Now those are already excluded or removed. And then of course there are like other practices of insurance company that are being done in the past like uh, if you have pre-existing conditions and then you didn't declare it, you cannot be taking advantage of your own medical insurance if you have those existing conditions. Of course, we are in a capitalist country that everything is driven by profit, but the United States government can uh, at least implement some measures that not everything is about profit. The benefits of Obamacare seem to have successfully made a difference in some American lives, but we can't ignore the fact that it failed to please the nation as a whole. We also cannot ignore that even top government officials are also at odds with what kind of new health care plan can be implemented, so we can only remain hopeful that what our new leaders have in store for us will help our country progress. But the first order of business is to repeal and replace Obamacare. The Republican plan to cut health care wouldn't make America great again, it would make America sick again and lead to chaos instead of affordable care. This is about people paying higher premiums every year and feeling powerless to stop it. It's about families paying deductibles that are so high it doesn't even feel like you have health insurance in the first place. Uh, that he has admonished the Congress uh, to be careful. And I reiterated that before the Republican conference today. Look, we're talking about people's lives. I, I am saying to every Republican right now, if you, in fact, can put a plan together that is demonstrably better than what Obamacare is doing, I will, I will publicly support repealing Ob Obamacare and replacing it with your plan, but I want to see it first. From Las Vegas, Nevada, I'm EBC correspondent Julianne DeSena, and I am one with 25. Thank you, Julianne DeSena. When we come back, we will bring you a feature on the First Ladies of the United States through the years, and stars who are holding back on U.S. President Donald Trump. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will be back shortly. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. The nation's fascination is not only focused on what the President of the United States has to offer to help make the country great again. The role of the presidential spouse and the title of First Lady of the United States, although not addressed in the Constitution, cannot escape the public's critical eye. There was a time when the spouses of the presidents were only expected to be the hostesses of the official residence of the President of the United States. Eventually, the First Ladies of the United States took on a bigger role and a louder voice. From fashion and trend setting, to covering for the President in social functions, to civic movements and bridging the gap between the people and the highest office in the land. The role of the First Lady of the United States has morphed into a very significant and influential one. Jennifer Paulintan of EBC New York has more. Take a look. 
There's a saying that behind every great man is an even greater woman. And while every president of the United States leaves an indelible mark upon our history, so does the FLOTUS. And what is FLOTUS? It's an acronym for the First Lady of the United States. The term was first coined in the 1980s, where it might have originated as the Secret Service's code for Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan's wife. Though according to history, the first FLOTUS would have been Martha Washington 227 years ago. The role of the First Lady has changed over the years. Some take on roles in political campaigns, while others take on more social causes. But one thing remains the same over the years, the FLOTUS has a huge influence in a variety of areas, anywhere from fashion to public policy. And because of their popularity, they remain the focus in the public eye long after their husband's terms have ended. Take for example, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Other notable first ladies in history? Nancy Reagan campaigned against drugs with her Just Say No initiative, while Hillary Clinton fought for gender equality and health care reform while her husband was president. She of course gained more attention when she ran against Trump for the presidential race this past year. Our current FLOTUS is Michelle Obama, and she is the first African-American First Lady of the United States. She's been viewed for years as a role model for women, an advocate for healthy families and for higher education. In 2009, Michelle Obama planted the White House Kitchen Garden to initiate conversations about health, and this led to the launching of her program, Let's Move. This program was launched in 2010 to help kids and families lead healthier lives. To support this program, President Obama established the first ever task force on childhood obesity and developed a plan to engage families and put them on a path to healthier living. Michelle Obama will be missed by many because she has gained a lot of popularity in the hearts of Americans. Our new incoming FLOTUS sure has big shoes to fill. Donald Trump's wife, Melania Trump, hasn't even stepped in the White House and she's already setting some precedents. She will not be moving into the White House after her husband takes oath. Instead, she'll continue to live in New York until their youngest son finishes the school year. But what plans and initiatives does Melania have while she is the First Lady? During a speech she gave before her husband was elected, she stated that as FLOTUS, she would fight online bullying and press for the advancement of women. Well, you know what they say, as one door closes, another one opens, and we're all eagerly waiting to see what the next four years will hold for us. Donald Trump has been making headlines in the news for months now, and one thing is most certain, that Melania will be having her share of news-breaking stories as well. For Eagle News International, the New York Bureau, I'm Jennifer Polentan, and I am one with 25. Thank you, Jennifer Polentan of EBC New York. Many an artist, especially the budding ones, would do anything for a crack at stardom. Not everyone gets the opportunity to be asked to perform for the president's inauguration ceremony. And yet, not everyone who are asked would just jump at the chance, no matter what the price tag is. Artists have become very vocal about their political views and standpoint. Not only have they inserted their ideals in their music or their productions, some have even gone to the lengths of instigating rallies and movements to speak their minds, hoping to make a difference. Ken Cruz of EBC Los Angeles shares with us why stars of Hollywood are saying no to the new president. Take a look. Hi, Ken Cruz here reporting from Los Angeles, California, home of a full gamut of celebrities from A-list stars to amateur actors and musicians. They don't agree on much, but they have taken a united stand to boycott the upcoming inauguration of Donald J. Trump. Now, this is in stark contrast to eight years ago when Barack Obama was sworn in office. Tickets were very hard to come by as his inauguration was filled with the who's who of A-list celebrities like Beyonce, Bon Jovi, John Legend, U2, just some of the big stars that came out to his big day. Now, the boycott isn't necessarily just something that the Democrats uh, put together because when George W. Bush um, sw was sworn into office, there were big stars that performed for him, Ricky Martin, Destiny's Child, Jessica Simpson. Now the list of those that are confirmed to perform for uh, Trump's inauguration are Toby Keith, Three Doors Down, and the Rockettes. Question is, where will these celebrities be? Well, one thing that they're going to be doing is a telecast, a telethon that day on the same time as the inauguration for the American Civil Liberties Union. 
Uh, also, the, the day after, A-listers like Scarlett Johansson, Katy Perry, Cher, will be taking part in a Women's March on Washington after the inauguration. Now, America is known for following the example of their idols. Will they follow suit to these celebrities? Time will tell. Until next time, I'm Ken Cruz, EBC LA correspondent, and I am one with 25. Thank you, Ken Cruz. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow as we bring you protests that filled the streets across the U.S. after President Donald J. Trump was sworn into office. I am Eliza Gonzalez Manglik Mott, and I'm always one with 25.